Morning, everybody. Everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, us, that's us live now, so we're, we're good to start. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you, everyone. I now declare the meeting open to the public online, and I'd like to welcome all of our members who are participating by video conferencing and thank members for their attendance at this uh, urgent meeting of the committee. Um, and I'll remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So uh, do we have any apologies, uh, Keith? Um, from Cara and Carol, who both sent their apologies. Okay, thank you. And um, yeah, I think we have everyone. Uh, well, anyone else aware of any apologies? No. Okay, thank you. Um, members, we are today having a single uh, item agenda to discuss a number of issues which will revolve around um, workforce planning, COVID forecasting and modelling, and the vaccination programme. Uh, there are departmental officials on the line at present, and I think we're waiting for one or two more to join us. But I propose that we'll start the meeting and they can join us as we as we go forward. We we'll get the presentations, get to the questions quicker that way. So I would really like to welcome the following um, officials. So I have, I'm showing on my screen, uh, Professor Ian Young, Chief Scientific Advisor. Can you hear me there, Professor Young? I can, yes. Thank you. Um, we also have Patricia Donnelly, um, who's in charge of the vaccination programme. Can you hear us okay, Patricia? I can. Good morning, Chair. Yeah, okay, thank you. And we are awaiting, um, we're awaiting Jim and Charlotte. So maybe what I propose is... Marks, and hopefully the others will have joined us by that stage, just to, just to facilitate getting the meeting underway. So I'll go to yourself, um, uh, Professor Young, just in order I have them here. I'll go to yourself first and then maybe to Patricia for your opening remarks. And thank you, Chair. I will give a, a brief update in terms of the current state of the epidemic um, and then talk a little bit about um, potential trends in the future. Um, the number of cases during the current wave initially peaked on the 22nd of July and following that we saw a reduction in cases which lasted um, around 10 days. Um, we believe that that was attributable to altered behaviours during the period of very hot weather which we experienced. So interactions occurred to a much greater extent outdoors and in addition, um, many people had windows open, which resulted in improved ventilation um, throughout the day. And both of those behavioural changes were of assistance. Since then, um, we've seen overall a progressive increase in case numbers, which continue to rise up to today. And there has been an alteration in testing behaviour as a result that of the fact that um, vaccinated close contacts no longer need to self-isolate and are um, encouraged to get a test, a PCR test at two days and eight days. That has encouraged increased testing, which is now at its highest level throughout the course of the epidemic and I think is helping us to detect more cases. But the case numbers do continue to um, rise slowly. In terms of the geographical distribution of cases, um, in particular levels are very high at the moment in Fermanagh and Tyrone and Derry City and Straban. Um, and indeed Fermanagh and Tyrone has the highest level of cases in the UK at present. That's not attributable to any single outbreak or even a small group of outbreaks, it's in keeping with and appears to be due to widespread community transmission. We know that it's inevitable that increased case numbers lead to increased hospital admissions and ICU occupancy and unfortunately deaths after a, a lag period. Um, admissions have been largely plateaued since um, late July at around 40 per day and continue at that level at present. 
because patients remain in hospital, in some cases for a significant time, um, numbers of inpatients have continued to rise slowly. And um, we anticipate that that may continue for a little further. The numbers of inpatients is in line with the central scenario that we modelled at the beginning of July, which indicated that we might reach around 400 inpatients or so towards the end of August. And we're somewhat below that at present. Um, pressures in critical care um, have been considerable. And as of yesterday, I think we'd risen to 49 patients um, with COVID in critical care. Um, hospital numbers are sitting around 45% of the peak they reached in the previous wave and critical care numbers closer to 60%, um, indicating um, a, a younger population of patients in hospital and um, a altered clinical pathways in terms of management and treatment. In terms of the future, we hope that we will be at a peak or plateau between now and the end of August in terms of case numbers and that they may even fall a little. Hospital pressures may not fall until early September. But we then have to deal with the return of um, largely unvaccinated population of school children. Um, and it's likely that that will lead to an increase in transmission of the virus as we move through September and into early October. Um, so there may be an additional impetus to the epidemic at that time. And we're currently looking at um, how severe that is likely to be along with colleagues elsewhere in the UK. Um, so that's my um, initial summary. Thank you, Ian. And we'll go across then to Patricia, please. Uh, good morning, Chair, committee members. Um, as usual, I thought it would be helpful if I gave you an update on the uh, vaccination programme. Uh, if I uh, apologies. I think Keith has my slides on the screen. Thank you. Uh, Keith, if we go to the third slide, please. Sorry, it's just taking a wee second to catch up. Okay. Um, and this is uh, from today's dashboard, and it will show that uh, we have vaccinated um, 1.256 million people. Uh, and uh, that represents 77% of the population is fully vaccinated. And we have uh, 85 to 86% of them um, who've had a first dose. If you go to the next slide, please, Keith. This is the one that I think members will find most interesting because this gives the um, uptake by age group. If I draw your attention to that, the middle section, which shows the 50 to 59 and all the ones above that, that average is out um, at 97%, which is a very high rate of uh, vaccination uptake. But it starts to drop below that. You will see in the 40 to 49 year olds, we are not quite at 86%. That kind of mirrors the overall adult population. And it drops significantly then below that age group. And you will see, I think I was here some weeks ago when we were in the low 60% uh, for the 18 to 29 year olds. Um, However, you'll see that's at 66%. And although it is steadily climbing, it is at a very low rate. Um, separately, you will see from that that we have begun in the last week to 10 days vaccinating 16 to 17 year olds, and we've already reached nearly 28% of them. We expect that that will steadily climb further, and they're coming forward in reasonable numbers at this stage. Um, and uh, so you can see where our concern is in this younger age population. If we go to the next slide. Uh, and this shows, the next slide will show first and second doses across all of those age groups. So you'll see that we have nearly fully vaccinated anyone 
um, over the age of 40, and indeed many people below the age of 40. And our analysis of this has been um, that anyone who does come forward for a first dose is likely to come and complete their course for a second dose. And that's very reassuring because that gives the highest standard of uh, protection. So our plans at the moment, I've, I've talked to you many times about the different plans that uh, we've had in place. If we go to the next slide, please, Keith. And you will see from this that the trust vaccination centres are currently giving first doses to 16 and 17 year olds. Um, we've not yet been advised by JCVI about a second dose for this age group. They have advised it would be a two dose programme, but it may be quite a long uh, interval between first and second doses. And um, we have been vaccinating some designated 12 to 15 year olds. You will know that these were in specific clinically vulnerable um, population and uh, many of those have now been vaccinated and the others are in progress. Um, this weekend, we decided that uh, the, it would be an opportunity and apologies, that should be the 21st and 22nd. I've realized I've made an error in the, in the dates. Uh, it's Saturday and Sunday. Um, there, uh, all the vaccination centers will open again for first doses for all age groups. You will know, Chair, that um, uh, some weeks ago we closed first doses. There were very few people coming forward at that stage over the age of 18. Um, and also we were mindful that uh, we had to provide second doses within eight weeks. And these vaccination centers in the next few weeks will close um, and be returned to councils who've been very supportive right through this process. But we thought we'd give a final push uh, to get people to come forward and then we'll set up some mobile clinics to support second doses. Um, so uh, trust will continue in the big centres. However, most people are now getting vaccinated in what we have as a hybrid model. We have pop-ups in the local areas where there's been low uptake and we do a weekly analysis of where those are. We're also influenced by where the high transmission rates are. Um, and we also go into estates where there's low uptake, but we also go to areas of high footfall. So you will have seen maybe shopping centres, uh, town centres, church halls, um, sports clubs, etc. Um, and there's been great uptake in these uh, and there's further plans for those. Um, we have a scheme in place for further education colleges and universities for the start of term. And uh, there's 187,000 people attend uh, these institutions. There's 44 campuses um, across Northern Ireland. And we're going to be working with trusts and the organizations and the PHA to organize uh, specific dedicated sessions for those coming back at the beginning of term. Uh, and we hope that will have a, a, a really good impact. Um, community pharmacy is an important part of this program. Uh, there are still pharmacies delivering AstraZeneca for first and second doses. Uh, that is that is now a diminishing uh, number. Um, but we are in the process of building up the capacity for pharmacies to use Moderna. Um, there's 48 as of this week, and this will be phased right through the next number of weeks. And we hope that Patricia, many Patricia, just apolog apologies there, Patricia. I just want to interrupt you for a wee minute, and I apologise for that. I want to check with Keith. Um, I've been made aware there in the past few minutes that we are not streaming. We're not streaming live, and I'm very conscious that you're now giving out some very useful information, and I don't want that to be. I don't want that to be missed or not picked up on. So I just want to check with the clerk first of all. Has the issue with the live stream been resolved, or does he have an estimate as to when that might be up and running? Sorry, Chair, we're working on it at the minute. Um, there seems to be a, a, been a wee bit of miscommunication um, and it's not being broadcast at the minute. So we're working on it to get it put on to all the, the Assembly's website, YouTube and all the rest. So um, I, I'm hoping to have an answer of when that will be sorted in the next, um, hopefully the next minute or so. Okay. Okay, well, um so we'll just we'll we'll give it a minute maybe or so to see if we get a, a resolution and um, when that is put up on the on YouTube, for example, Keith, do they take from the start or do they just take from where they where they come in? They will take from where it's live. So they're working on it at the minute. The the quickest one they can get it on is the, the assembly's website. Um, okay. So um, they're working on that at the minute. I'm just updating to make sure um, we've got something through to say that it, it seems that it's. That it's working on the assembly's website and it's been on youtube as well so i think 
I think we're good to continue now, Chair. Okay, so maybe if you would just pick up again, Patricia, where you were outlining where all the vaccines are available from, because I think that's crucial crucial information at the moment. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, this is available on NI Direct, so that there's an interactive map for the pharmacies where they're available, and also those pharmacies now delivering Moderna. And you will remember I've previously briefed Moderna as a messenger RNA uh, vaccine, um, suitable for all ages, and indeed MHRA this week approved it down to the age of 12. So in fact, it's a very flexible vaccine, somewhat similar to Pfizer. Um, and because it's somewhat similar to Pfizer, there have been challenges about the low um, temperature and the handling of it. And therefore, we've had to phase the um, uh, the development of this in a community pharmacies. But we're hoping by September that all of the pharmacies will have this available right around Northern Ireland. And in this first stage of the spread, we're very mindful to uh, around equity and we've had them spread very um, carefully around Northern Ireland. Um, pharmacies will also provide the what we call the evergreen program. And that means for those who've not yet made a decision uh, to become vaccinated, and once the trust vaccination program finishes in September, they will still be able to access the um, vaccine through community pharmacy. And again, these are locally accessible and will, I think will prove very popular. GPs have virtually completed their program at this stage. Um, there's very few second doses now been given. And as I said, they've vaccinated, they've delivered over 800,000 uh, doses. So you can see this part of the program is very much in, a, in quite a complex phase, but we are entering a final phase through this month and next. Uh, Keith, the final slide, please. So this tells us uh, just where we are and what the challenges are. Um, as of today, 78% of the adult population are fully vaccinated, uh, which is reassuring. Um, we have only um, 85, just over 85, nearly 86% have had their first dose. Um, but to reach 90%, we need a further 67,000 uh, people vaccinated. And we are continually working with uh, our uh, communications and media uh, department, uh, working across all modalities, um, working with, um, I think there's a project uh, with various youth groups and with others um, uh, to look at what would be the most effective way of communicating with younger people. We're trying to make the vaccine as accessible as possible. We know that's an important um, uh, part for young people. And we're also providing very detailed information about the safety and indeed the information uh, to support people's decision to go forward for vaccination. So, Chair, very happy to take any questions. I know I raced through some very detailed information there. Okay, and, and I appreciate you, the brevity as well, given the amount of uh, speakers we have and, and the short time frame we have for today's meeting. Um, we're running up to 11 o'clock. So we have now been joined by uh, Professor Sheridan McCardle, Chief Nursing Officer, and by Jim Wilkinson. Um, and Jim is the head of the Healthcare Policy Group. So I'll go first of all to yourself, Charlotte, if you want to make some opening remarks, and then I'll go to Jim. Uh, good morning, um, Chair and Committee. Um, I'm uh, providing the opening remarks for, for Jim and I, and, and Jim then will uh, follow with any policy um, areas. So I, I want to start by acknowledging the response of our health and social care system to the pandemic. I think it's important that we, we do take a moment just to recognise um, the contribution that has been made by uh, healthcare professionals, social workers, uh, social care staff, but also the porters, the cleaners, the administrative team, the managers, and the executive teams in our, in uh, across our health system, which, I mean, I think have been out, outstanding and amazing. And my personal thanks to them. And the minister is on record several times, obviously, for um, uh, publicly acknowledging his gratitude um, on many occasions. And the pressure on the system at the moment is immense and Ian has given you some of the figures there in relation to COVID hospital admissions and ICU um, admissions teetering there around 50 um, for, for the last uh, uh, week or so and um, pretty constant at, at that at that level. Um, we, we've moved from one surge to another, um, you know, straight in one to another and at the same time tried to keep a very finely balanced system going and this has meant that things have really had to change dramatically and regretfully for patients that has been difficult and I would want to absolutely acknowledge that most sincerely 
but it's also very difficult for staff because they want to deliver the best care and the best outcome that they can. And it's frustrating for them uh, and for to see their services change and to have to reprioritize and reschedule um, services over the course of the pandemic. And, and there's no part of the health service that's been unaffected by this. And from, from the emergency departments through to uh, surgery and, and into the, the, the COVID areas and the intensive cares, out into the community, for school nursing, for health visiting, for GP practice, there's no area that has been untouched by this. And I think nurses and midwives in particular are very pressurised, um, have been during the pandemic, but, but at the moment in particular, um, they've kept the system going. And every time there needs to be another change or another ask, uh, it's the nurses and midwives that, that are asked to make that change. And they are, of course, supported by all of their professional colleagues and very grateful for the intervention of other, other disciplines to support uh, the nursing and midwifery teams during, during the pandemic. But staff are very tired and when people are tired, morale often drops, uh, sickness rises as we're seeing and people do start to uh, think about and reevaluate their, um, their own personal lives. And I think we're starting to see that in the health service. Uh, particularly within the, the nursing and midwifery uh, groups. And it's important that staff feel and know that they're valued. And one way, of course, that we can value our staff is, is to make sure that we get everyone vaccinated and to get that 67,000 people that Patricia just referred to vaccinated, because that's a real demonstration to the staff uh, that people appreciate the efforts that they're going through. The shortage of frontline nurses uh, and, and midwives in Northern Ireland is um, is well documented, and I, I'm not going to dwell on that. But the minister and the department has instigated a range of measures, uh, particularly in the last five years. And it's important. I mean, these things are not easily solved overnight, and they do need strategic plans. And those plans are being in, in place to strengthen and support the workforce in the short, in the medium, and indeed the longer term. But in particular, to stabilise the nursing and midwifery workforce. And the commitments that were given in the um, from the executive back in January 2020, which seems like a long time ago now, to invest 60 million in safe staffing over the next five years is starting to work itself through the system and is crucially important for enhancing both the capacity, but also the capability of nursing and midwifery uh, to deliver the transformation agenda and the rebuilding of service that we will need very quickly uh, whenever uh, COVID is, is no longer um, a pandemic. Implementing the delivering care policy in full is a key priority, and that is very much aligned with the safe staffing investment in the nursing and midwifery workforce. And one of the recommendations uh, you will know in the nursing and midwifery task group report. And in this current year, we have secured 25 million of the 60 million uh, commitment to safe staffing that was made in a new decade, new, new approach. And priority areas for investment this year include mental health, district nursing, um, emergency care pre-operative um, theatre nursing, critical care nursing, cancer services, learning disability, school nursing, health visiting and midwifery. A regional investment plan is being currently progressed with an additional 290 additional posts. But many of those posts, importantly, are uh, in those key priority areas and they will be consultant nurse midwifery posts, expanding the role of nurses and midwives, looking at advanced nurse practitioner roles, specialist practice and clinical education roles, with an emphasis on supporting a clinical career pathway and to encourage uh, nurses to remain in cl clinical practice and also to support uh, the retention of our staff. Um, the workforce data, um, which uh, I I'm sure we, you will want more detail on, um, recent reports in the media have referred to the I just want to check with the clerk. Um... Charlotte has frozen on my feed. Has she frozen with you as well? Yeah, chair, she has. We'll try and get her back on. Yeah, okay. Sure, I can maybe pick up on some of the opening remarks Charlotte was going to make and let us move on a bit. Yes, go ahead. That'll be useful, Jim. Okay. Thank you. I think the point Charlotte was going to make in terms of recent 
um, reports regarding vacancies and turnover is that um, certainly nursing and midwifery is, is almost 26% of the entire workforce. So we would normally expect in any year a turnover of about a thousand. So some of the numbers quoted are not beyond what we would expect. And I think as well, it's, it's important to say within the health and social care system, some of the turnover is within that system. So some, for example, resignations that might be reported um, in one trust actually appears recruitment in another trust, but that's not always always tracked. Um, I think that said, the key element and the, and the important element for us is that the workforce has been increasing over the last three years, uh, as Charlotte indicated, and that is the trajectory that we're following. Um, uh, and as well as that increase in, in uh, the workforce, it's also important that we do that on a strategic basis and look at what the workforce training needs, both pre-registration and post-registration, and that's been really part of our workforce development proposals. Mm -hmm. I think um, Charlotte would also wanted to say quite a bit about sort of workforce recovery and well-being in that context of, of our opening remarks. Uh, and that's to say with, with all the challenges of the pandemic, uh, there has been challenges on the workforce and that's those have been critical. Um, there has been initiated a regional staff wellbeing work stream uh, in response to COVID-19, working closely with medical mental health services, the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Authority. And our minister also published a framework supporting the wellbeing needs of our health and social care staff. And in February 2021, the goal command stream we have for looking at the pandemic um, supported the introduction of a pilot program called Thrive um, to help and support the psychological needs of staff as they finish under the pandemic. Uh, to date, that, sec that uh, scheme has received 77 referrals. And I think it's already was there, I would have stressed that this is one of our key priorities in terms of ensuring the mental health and well being of our staff as they work through and emerge from the pandemic. We're happy to take any questions the committee might have. Um, from my perspective, my role in this is at the sort of strategic level in terms of workforce planning and development, um, the overall workforce and issues that we've been looking at in the pandemic in terms of our workforce appeal and those areas. As I said, you're happy to take um, any questions and I'm hopefully Charlotte will be able to join us again shortly. Okay, thank you, um, Jim. <clears throat> Okay, members, I propose now that I am aware that Professor Young does need to leave us this morning at 10.45. So I want to make sure that every, all members get a chance to uh, direct questions towards him at this crucial stage. So what I propose to do is we'll take a quick round of questions exclusively with Professor Young, unless he needs to bring in maybe Patricia or something on a particular issue around a question. But we we'll focus on, on Professor Young and then we'll do another round with more generally and Ian can stay for as long as he can, and we can move on then to sort of more questions for Patricia and Charlotte and Jim. So um, I will I will start then. I just want to clarify something with you, uh, Ian, in terms of you you mentioned in your in your uh, briefing there, and and thank you all for the briefings that you've given us. But you'd mentioned altered clinical pathways and treatments. Can you elaborate a little more on what what you mean and what the impact of that is likely to be in terms of hospital services? So during the course of the epidemic, um, as a result of ongoing clinical investigations, a range of new treatments have become available um, and they have been used principally in the hospital setting. And those have included a, a range of different um, medications and also altered treatment pathways in terms of approaches to ventilation, the type of oxygen treatment which is used and how in the course of the of an individual um, patient's journey um, that is instigated. In addition to that, um, in the current wave, we're seeing a higher proportion of younger people admitted to hospital than in previous waves um, of the epidemic. And one of the factors which influences clinical decision making in terms of thresholds for admission to critical care um, is age along with a, a range of other factors. So that is likely to have resulted in um, an alteration in the pr proportion of hospitalized patients who are receiving or requiring treatment in the critical care setting. Okay, thank you. In terms of uh, the, the modeling, when do you anticipate that this uh, this 
wave will peak now and where do you anticipate that will leave hospital pressures given we're on 104 percent as of today in terms of capacity so when do you think this wave is likely to peak i think in terms of case numbers um it's most likely that it will peak within the next week or so and um, because of the change in testing strategy which i referenced in my introduction that has introduced an additional variable and it may make a difference to that estimate. It wasn't something that we had included in the original modeling because it wasn't envisaged to happen. And it will take a few days for the testing to settle down and see what impact that has. In terms then of the hospital pressures, we anticipate that they'll peak probably 10 days to two weeks after that, which is likely to take us into early September, late August. Um, as I indicated, Chair, we then have to um, deal with the impact of return of schools and universities. And we know from earlier in the epidemic that that increases transmission of the virus. So um, I think there will be a peak of sorts and a slight reduction, which is most likely then to be followed by a further increase in case numbers um, after schools and universities return. So unfortunately, I think we're looking for to a significant period where there'll be a considerable number of COVID patients requiring hospital treatment. The total preferences that you, the total pressures that you um, referenced include not only COVID, but also all of the other services and treatments which our hospitals need to address. And I think Charlotte or Jim would be better placed to comment on that but it is clear that in general there are considerable non-covid pressures in terms of delivery of health and social care and i suspect that you know um, hospital pressures are going to remain at a very high level for certainly the next two to three months at an absolute minimum okay but i take it i take it and i will bring that up with charlotte when we when we come to her but i take it that Charlotte's information is feeding into the decisions and the advice that you're providing the executive in terms of what is manageable? Um, so certainly, um, Chair, um, we provide executive advice which takes account of the pressures that are likely to result from COVID. And then also information is provided about the total pressures which the hospital system faces. Okay, and in relation to all of that and, and those worries that you have outlined there around those unvaccinated children, we're aware that there are there have been um, some changes made in terms of the schools system and the bubbling, and, and there is some confusion around that this morning. But um, what would the likely impact be? There has been some talk about all restrictions gone by the end of October. What is your assessment of what the impact of that is likely to be? Or is that something that, that is realistic? I think decisions about um, removal of restrictions obviously are a matter for ministers taking account of not just the effects on COVID, but also the impact of the restrictions themselves on society, family life and the economy. Um, but certainly the re uh, further removal of restrictions will tend to increase the transmission of the virus. We're very clear on that and we'll try to indicate the, the consequences of that in terms of COVID pressures, which then need to be considered in the broader context, um, you know, in, in terms of timing of removing remaining restrictions. Okay, and the last one then from me before I go to members on, on this section is around, you had mentioned there towards the end, the testing um, regime and, and system that's in place there at the minute. What are the current returns in terms of positive tests coming back out of the system? So, um, we look at positivity in different ways. The main indicator of positivity that what we use, which is the percentage of total laboratory tests which are positive, is currently stable at between eight and a half and nine percent. Now that is high um, historically compared with previous stages of the epidemic, but it does represent a fall in terms of where positivity was, say, two to three weeks ago. So positivity peaked um, around again the 22nd of July, then fell somewhat and has remained plateaued. While testing has increased 
and case numbers have increased. So the the, the vaccine, the, the dashboard is shown there um, as of yesterday, 3989 tested in the past seven days, 1345 positive. So how does that tally? So that's that's a 33% approximately positive to testing. How does that tally with the eight or nine percent, Ian? What's what's changing that figure? So um as I indicated, um positivity is calculated in various ways. I mean the number of tests, the number of positive cases in the last week, um, and I don't have it quite at my fingertips, but um, the number of positive tests in the last seven days. 3989. No, it's it's actually, I'm not sure quite where that figure comes from, Chair, um, but the number of cases is significantly higher than that because we currently are at over 1,000 a day in terms of positive okay. tests. Okay, I'm taking that off the dashboard there. But anyway, go go ahead with the with your with with the the higher figure. Then where does the the um, ratio sit? Um, as I say, it's it sits between eight and a half and nine percent in terms of test positivity. And uh, where where should where should that be in an ideal situation as chief scientific advisor? Where should that be? Well, in if I could wave my magic wand, it would be zero, chair. But. Um, more realistically, at earlier stages in the epidemic, um, below 5% is a reasonable goal in terms of, um, you know, indicating in general that community transmission is limited. So is there a need then for more flexibility within that testing system in terms of now that we're, we're 18 months and more into the pandemic? Do we need to be able to scale up testing much quicker during these surges? And is that being worked upon? Um, there is plenty of testing capacity, Chair. Testing is at the highest level that it has been at any point during the um, epidemic. Tests are freely available to anyone who wishes them in terms of lateral flow tests at home or access to PCR testing. So there is absolutely no limit of any kind on test availability at present. So then how do you return to your, your the 5% rather than the 8 and 9 percent that we're seeing currently so the problem so um in order to achieve five percent we have to reduce the number of cases of the virus not increase the the testing um you know so that's the that's the the driver um at previous stages of the epidemic when the percentage positivity has been below five percent testing has been at much lower levels um, the issue isn't about the amount of testing, it's about the amount of transmission of the virus and um, which is taking place in the community. The survey, the population survey, which ONS have been conducting on our behalf, um, indicates that somewhere between 1% and 2% of the Northern Ireland population have the virus at the moment. Um, you know, and... and Obviously, people come forward for testing in general when they have some symptoms. So because the prevalence of the virus is so high, it's inevitable that positivity will be at a reasonably high level. Yeah, but I do I do agree with you, actually, that what the key thing that we need to be doing in that case is to suppress transmission, which would also then have a beneficial knock-on effect, first and foremost, on, on the population health, but secondly, on the healthcare system, which Charlotte has outlined is so hard, so hard-pressed. Okay, listen. I want I want to get to other members. Um, so I'll go I'll go just to, as in the order members have indicated. Um, starting with Paula, Jerry, Pam, Alan, and Arlea. So go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for the update this morning. Um, Professor Young, the first question I'd like to ask is in relation to ventilation in classrooms. You know, the Irish government are introducing the CO two monitors, and I'm just wondering, is that something that you're working with the Department of Education on? Um, our work with the Department of Ventilation has um, stressed the importance of ventilation in school settings um, and ideally um, we would like to have windows open as much as possible which is relatively easy while the temperatures are warm but obviously becomes more challenging in the winter. There have been a range of approaches um, to that in different countries. I understand in Germany they had a rule where windows were open for five minutes every 30 minutes, regardless of the external 
temperatures um, to improve our flow. Um, there has recently been a report from the Royal Academy of Engineering on um, ventilation and a number of SAGE reports on ventilation, how that can be best achieved and monitored. CO2 monitoring may have a role, and certainly we've highlighted that to Department of Education colleagues, but it's by no means um, full, it's by no means a fail safe, as is illustrated by the SAGE reports in terms of the challenges of CO2 monitoring. Okay, thank you. The second question is uh, if the department has an update on the vaccine passports for students who got their first dose in GB and their second in Northern Ireland. Um, I think, unfortunately, that would need to be um, addressed by the Chief Digital Information Officer, who's not here today. Um, I know that there's awareness of the issue and that, um, and that the department was working on providing a solution. Um, the last information I had, which was last week, was that it was imminent, but unfortunately I don't have any further updates since since then. There were four nation discussions and I understood it was a problem for Scotland, Wales and England as well. Okay, thank you. And finally, very quickly, um, yesterday we were expecting the NICE guidance on ME um, to be released and, and there was a delay on that and that's left a lot of patients very upset. Um, when, those, when the guidance is issued for this other long, um, sorry, post-viral syndrome, um, will they be adopted automatically by the Department of Health here? Because a lot of them are asking that. That's my final question here. Um, you, you'll appreciate that that's slightly outside my normal territory, but there is a, a, a pathway to consider NICE guidance um, in Northern Ireland and in general, NICE guidance after consideration of any local issues is adopted um, with a very small number of exceptions. And I'm sure that the ME guidance, when it's made available, will go through that conventional pathway and be considered in the usual way. I say the vast majority of guidance um, from NICE is adopted within Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And thank you both for, for uh, being succinct there to allow everyone. So just remind members that this, this round of questioning is directed principally at Professor Young, and then we'll come back to a more general for all members, another general round of questioning, um, just in light of Ian needing away at a particular time. So we'll go then to Jerry. Carol, go ahead, Jerry. Leanna Ray, Lila Hull. Yeah, well, thanks, um, Chair, and thanks, panel. Um, just two quick questions for Ian. I mean, obviously, there's been a an increase in um, um, concerts and sort of live music events and, and football and sporting events and yeah, far from me to begrudge people uh, some sense of uh, enjoyment or normality for the year that uh, and year and a half they've been through. But is there a sense of an increase in um, transmission and cases uh, as a result of that? And if there is a, um, a, a an estimated increase, uh, what is the scale and size of it? estimated uh, to be and when will we see that uh, and then just my other question um the chair asked it but you know i didn't really hear a, a clear answer to be frank um about the the call to lift all restrictions by the end of i think september isn't it the end of next month um you know uh, we heard some stats um from, from yourself ian uh but you know is, is it your view is it the cmo's view that that would be a wise thing that would be a, a logical thing um, I wanted just to hear a, 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 an opinion, uh, an analysis of that call uh, to lift all restrictions by the end of next uh, month. That's me. Thanks. Um, thank you. Um, in relation to large events, um, it's inevitable that large events will lead to some increase in virus transmission, um, as will follow any setting where people gather together in large numbers. Um, and particularly in a noisy environment where people are tending to shout um, in order to be heard or to cheer on in terms of a favourite sporting team, etc. Um, it's not only the event themselves, and in general, events in many cases have been well marshaled, but it's the travel to and from events and the socialising which occurs before and after events which leads to transmission. There's been some careful study of the Euros in England and Wimbledon, um, which, um, while it hasn't been published, I think have suggested some significant cases. And we have seen, um, in relation to some recent Northern Ireland events, um, evidence that there have been some 
um, outbreaks associated with attendance. So as I say, it may not be the event themselves. It could be behaviours before and after the event. We can't put um, a number on that, um, but certainly we welcome the evidence that event, the, the efforts that event organisers have made um, to try to reduce those risks and both by attendance at the events and, for example, in the case of Custom House Square, Belsonic and Fela, the requirement either for evidence of vaccination or a negative COVID test prior to attending the event. Those things will help, but they will not stop the risk completely. Um, if we move to large indoor gatherings and events, then the risk will be significantly greater than for outdoor gatherings and events. In terms then of the, the second question, I, I apologize if my response didn't seem clear, um, but um, you know I just need to go back and say, I, I thought it was fairly clear. We give advice on the impact of removing the relaxations on COVID, removing further, sorry, removing further restrictions will increase COVID spread further. Um, that is inevitable. And we will attempt to say whether we think the risk is high or moderate or low in terms of individual relaxations. That does not mean that relaxations can't take place. That's a matter for um, ministers because they have to take account of the effect of the restrictions themselves, which we're all aware of and which are quite significant. So, you know, we don't say yes or no. We give advice in terms of the level of risk, which would be associated in COVID terms with certain decisions. Okay, thank you. Okay, Jerry. Yep. Okay, I'm going then to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you all for your, for your presence this morning at this um, committee. Um, Professor Young, I just wanted to ask you if you want to take this opportunity this morning, um, given that we have the, this big job event happening uh, this weekend and, and we know that we need to get those vaccinations up as high as possible um, in order to basically turn to return to normal as quickly as possible. I think that's what we're all aiming for. I just want to know if you want to take this opportunity maybe to address some of the myths and uh, some of the the reasons that young people in particular are so reluctant to to actually um, be vaccinated or or they seem to be taking their time about making that final decision. Um, do you want to address that now? And could you also uh, comment on uh, where we are with vaccination of over 12s and whether that's um, uh, potentially going to come in uh, to uh, as a, uh, another option in the near future? Um, certainly, and, and thank you for the opportunity, and Patricia may wish to add um, something something to this. Um, as we approach this this weekend, and, and we're calling it the Big Jab Weekend, as Patricia said, then we'll be engaging fairly heavily with media um, today and tomorrow. And some of that will be, I hope, through channels which younger people use, <laughs> trying to um, address some of the the myths and the um, doubts which are associated with um, with vaccination and which lead to people not being <laughs> Having said that, I think that there's only a small percentage of the Northern Ireland population who are um, really doubtful about vaccination. I think there's a somewhat larger group who haven't quite got themselves organised um, or come forward to take advantage of the vaccination opportunities. And that's what this weekend is about. It's about um, making vaccination as available as we can to, to everybody. But in terms of some of the, the myths, and I'll be talking more about this in other places later today, um, we know that younger women are concerned about misinformation circulating about the effects of vaccination on fertility. And I'll be absolutely clear and say that there's no scientific evidence um, that there's any effect of vaccination on fertility. And indeed, furthermore, that for um, women who are pregnant, 
and some of whom unfortunately have become seriously ill as a result of getting the virus. Vaccination is also encouraged. So no effects whatsoever of vaccination on fertility. Um, you know, then there are certain bizarre rumours circulating about microchips in the vaccine, um, about um, effects of vaccination in terms of making you magnetic when you go through scanners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, those things are just completely um, fake news, to use the term that's become popularised in the last couple of years. No truth whatsoever. All all vaccines, um, as all medical treatments um, do, can be associated with some side effects. So certainly we're not saying that vaccination never has side effects. The vast majority of side effects after vaccination are mild ones. They're a sore arm, maybe feeling a bit out of sorts for no more than two to three days in the overwhelming majority of cases. Very rarely there are more severe side effects. Um, and when I talk about very rare, I'm talking about maybe one in a hundred thousand, for example. But what we need to stress is that the side effects of getting COVID are much more severe and much more common than anything which might be associated with vaccination. And furthermore, that um, being vaccinated does not just protect you, the person who gets vaccinated, against those effects, but it also protects us all in society. You're much less likely to transmit the virus, to become infectious yourself if you've been vaccinated. It protects your parents, it protects your grandparents, and it's our pathway to allowing everyday life to resume. For example, nightclubs to open in due course, that's much more likely if we get a high percentage of younger people um, vaccinated. So as I say, that there are some other myths, there's an endless list, and I hope to address some of the other ones later on today along with, um, with colleagues. But please don't be misled, I would say. Come forward this weekend, there's a great opportunity. Let's push those numbers up to over 90%. And that's going to make a huge difference to what happens to us all in the next six months. Thank you. Um, Pam, yeah. Yeah, thank sure. you. Thank you, for that, Professor. Um, uh, could you also comment on the uh, vaccination over 12s? Well, Sorry. that's a possibility. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Pam. Can I also say that um, we've conducted many surveys and we think there's somewhere around 5 to 7% of people who do not wish to have, uh, wish to be vaccinated, I think, under any circumstances. So all the campaigns and that counter to the misinformation that Ian was describing are targeted uh, to the others and the other younger people who are feeling it's not going to affect them, it's not going to, you know, that... They think that the, that the vaccine really isn't relevant to their lives. However, what we are seeing, and we've been approached by, for example, sports clubs, where a member has become seriously ill, a younger member, seriously ill uh, with COVID, and those others have then reacted to say, this is real because now I've met someone, I experienced this directly. And so we've worked with the trusts to provide outreach and vaccination clinics in those clubs or in those uh, uh, facilities. So I do think it's more about direct experience rather than uh, the preaching to the converted or hearing what experts say. I think younger people are much more influenced by each other. If I then go to the over 12s, um, the advice to date has been to vaccinate those over 12s with particular neuro disabilities or conditions that would make them vulnerable. That's already underway. There's less than 2,000 of them. And uh, also a number of 12 to 15 year olds who are living with someone who is immunosuppressed. So they're getting vaccinated to protect that individual. Um, uh, and that would be the key. And again, a few hundred of those, not very many. But JCVI continue to review the evidence. You'll be aware that there's policy in, in some other uh, countries to vaccinate this age group. 
But JCVI are very minded to balance the risks and the harms for younger people. Um, and uh, so they're continuing to review that evidence. We haven't heard anything more from them uh, on this, but I believe the work is not yet done for them. So, uh, Pam, no final decision about this, but um, as we've always said, we can expect anything from JCVI and therefore we'll um, adapt uh, in whatever way is needed to vaccinate if, if, uh, if required. Thank you. Thank you, Pam and Patricia and Alan Chambers. Go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, good morning, Professor Young. Just uh, once again, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you and your colleagues for all the work that you're doing to contain this virus. Uh, you told us at the beginning of your presentation that the uh, figures uh, coming out of Fermanagh are, are quite disturbing, and in fact, they are the highest in the United Kingdom, and, and it's also an issue in Derry City and Strabane. Um, is are these figures uh, of transmission and, and cases in any way uh, related to the vaccination uptake in those areas? Is there any connection between that, uh, or have you identified any other uh, obvious causes uh, why these uh, areas, particularly the Fermanagh area, would be uh, in the situation that it's currently in? Well, it's a it's a good question, and I wish I could put my finger on a single clear reason why we're seeing this pattern. There is some variation in vaccine uptake, as you would expect, um, across Northern Ireland, and we are factoring that into the availability of pop-up vaccine clinics, etc. In fact, Derry City and Strabane has a fairly high level of vaccine uptake, so um, the high levels of transmission are not related in any straightforward way to the proportion of the population who have been vaccinated. I think that then raises the possibility that it may relate to behaviours um, in terms of um, how people are acting. And also, um, you know, we need to consider the possibility, given the regions of Northern Ireland which are highest at the moment, that there may be some link with um, prevalence and uptake of vaccine in neighbouring regions of the Republic of Ireland, um, given the free movement of people across the, the borders. So we don't have any simple explanation for what's happening, but there is ongoing work by the Public Health Agency and colleagues in the Republic of Ireland in neighbouring areas to um, message and try to address both vaccine uptake and behaviours at a local level. Um, certainly there is not any single outbreak or even a small number of outbreaks to explain this. It's a much more widespread issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alan. And going then to Arlea. Go ahead, Arlea, please. Uh, Gormi Ogut Colum, and thanks very much, um, Professor Young, for um, your presentation this morning. I just wanted to ask, um, the last time the Health Committee met a number of weeks ago, when we were talking about the, the modelling, um, I know at that stage you were talking about the hospital pressures were um, sitting between the pessimistic and the central, um, and the critical care at that stage was probably sitting around the pessimistic um, phase of the modelling. And I'm just wondering where we are today is the hospital pressures and critical care still at that same phase? Um, or has that shifted any between the, the central and pessimistic? So thank you. So currently hospital pressures are sitting round about central in terms of the modelling that we did at the beginning of July. So the situation, while it's very challenging at the moment, um, is somewhat better than it could have been. Um, and that reflects the fact, I think, that vaccination has um, pushed on and we continue to see the benefits of the programme. In terms of critical care, it still it remains somewhat above central, although it's fallen away from the pessimistic level. And I discussed some of the factors which I think are underpinning the heavier demands on critical care um, you know, earlier in my presentation. 
as I say, the timing of this hospital peak was always estimated to be late August, early September. And that remains the case. Um, although, as I said, we then move into what may be a, a challenging autumn with additional transmission following the return of schools and universities. Um, thank you, Professor. And just on that, that point then, um, because you had mentioned earlier that obviously so the expectation or the fear is that when the schools return that we are going to see an increase in transmissions um, and that's for the schools and the universities. And then I'm just conscious that that all is also going to coincide with you know, your normal expected winter pressures. So is there, um, you, you were, you had mentioned that you were obviously looking at how severe this is going to be. Do you have a timeline for um, when that sort of revised modelling or predictions can be made? Because I'm just thinking, you know, like how soon can the health service start to prepare and plan, you know, for the, the, the worst case scenario? So um, we're, obviously looking at a, a number of separate things here. Firstly, there's the normal winter pressures which the health service experiences, which are often very demanding. And I'm sure Charlotte may return to those later. Um, there's the possibility of RSV, which is a virus in that affects young children, um, being more severe this year than on a typical year. Um, the precautions that we took against COVID last year also reduced the spread of a range of other viruses, um, particularly RSV in children and the flu virus in adults. So it's possible that both of those may be significantly worse this winter than usual. And we're trying to plan for that. And then thirdly, there's the potential for background levels of COVID. And we talk about moving to COVID being endemic, meaning that it will be a normal winter virus like the flu virus, and that every year we will have some level of outbreak. And this may be the first winter where we begin to see that pattern, but it could be a difficult winter um, for COVID more than I hope most future winters will be, and superimposed on increased RSV, increased influenza, and normal winter pressures. So it's the totality of that that we have to think about and that our hospitals will have to plan for. In terms of the COVID modeling, we'll be updating that within the next one to two weeks um, with a view to presenting it to the executive so that it can inform their decisions around remaining relaxations. And we'll also talk at that stage about the other issues that I have referenced. OK, thank you. Um, and just just finally, then, um, on, on that point of the uh, because I'm conscious of the flu and that RSV virus in, in young children. And excuse my ignorance, I'm not over the detail of, of what that virus is. But is is that something that can be sort of easily um, controlled or, or managed? You know, is that sort of familiar to the health service? at present you know so if there is a, an increase in those type of viruses you know we know how to deal with the flu so if there is an increase in that rsv will that be manageable for the health service professor so the health service certainly is used to to dealing with it very very small children um, can get rsv and people sometimes talk about the croup the croup and it causes um a bad cough and can lead to breathing difficulties and young children can become extremely ill and may require very intensive support as a result of RSV. And that happens to an extent every winter. So um, the health service is well used to, to dealing with it, but um, it's quite possible that it may be you know, one and a half or twice as common this winter as it is on a, a typical winter. And that will bring extra pressures, particularly in terms of children's services across our trusts. Um, influenza, obviously, we are used to dealing with um, every winter and tends to affect older adults and the vulnerable in particular. And we'll be pushing out very actively a flu vaccination program um, this autumn and winter. And it's going to be particularly important given the extra risks that as many people as possible get their flu vaccine in addition to um, the COVID vaccination program. 
Okay, thank you. I hope you have a successful weekend this week with the, the jobs. Sorry, Colm, you're muted. Okay, thank you, Claire. Okay, members, thank you. So we'll go then to, to other questions. So I'll go first of all um, to yourself, Charlotte, I think, actually. Um, we have seen in recent weeks, and, and, and I, I want to endorse, first of all, your words around the, uh, the efforts of the staff, the frontline staff. I also will declare the interest that my, my wife is a, is a nurse in the community and also that I have worked previously as a social worker. Um, but I think the committee very, very much share that um, admiration and gratitude for what the staff have done over a very extensive period of time now. And actually, um, this urgent meeting and the urgent meeting which we, we had earlier in the summer are a reflection of those concerns. That was the principal reason why we, we arranged both of these meetings. Um, I know that we had hoped to speak to yourself, Charlotte, the last time and you weren't able, but I'm certainly glad that you're here today because this is a key issue, I think, for for us, um, not only for those staff themselves, but also in terms of in terms of the, the service they provide to us all as a community. So um, th that that's the context in which we are actually meeting. So I, I do certainly agree that. Um, in relation to the resignations, and and we know there has been a report of, of a number of resignations. And notwithstanding, Jim has said that some of those may have gone to to other trusts, and I think that actually should be tracked. So they're not uh, feeding into that that uh, information. It, sh it would seem relatively easy that you would retain that information. But can I ask, Charlotte, are you doing lever interviews with people who resign in those circumstances to get to the bottom of why they're resigning, where they're going, and what the solutions might be in order to stabilise and support the workforce? Um, thanks, Chair. So, um, I mean, I think it's regrettable that uh, people are leaving, but... Um, I suppose that's a natural sort of turnover that we would see in the health service for people to move around our system or to explore other opportunities, either for personal reasons or for career development or to to go to alternative careers. And I, I'm sorry that I cut out just at the sort of important point when I was coming to the workforce data, but I, and I caught the tail end of J Jim's response. But, you know, there are 18 and a half thousand nurses um, in the health service. So we would expect a normal turnover rate to be in the region of about a thousand per annum, and that's that's what we've seen over over years. So while it's regrettable that there is a a, a number which has been identified um, as levers, um, I think it's in the context of that thousand, and it's part of the normal turnover. Um, I do know that uh, all trusts have in place um, exit policies, which include. Uh, lever interviews to to gather that information and then obviously it's further collected on the the HRPTS uh, data system and um, the reason that people are leaving are are multiple um, as you say many are for retirement reasons many it's for more flexible or some it's for more flexible working others are moving for career opportunities they're moving around the system in terms of uh, trusts uh, small numbers of people leaving because they're relocating to other countries. Uh, a, a small but um, slightly increasing number of people um, taking up full-time, more flexible employment with, with agencies um, at the moment. But I, I really do want to emphasise that those numbers are small and they're in context of a workforce of 18,500 in the health service, and that's without our colleagues working in the social care system. Okay, thank, thanks for that, Charlotte. And I suppose, I suppose, uh, the impact the impact is massive. When when we see trusts having to having to cancel surgeries, you know, the impact on those people who are being cancelled is absolutely massive. It's also a massive impact on the staff who are having to move around and trying to cover and etc. In terms of the at the start of the COVID, there was a COVID a workforce appeal, and there was I think over three thousand something close to three thousand five hundred people responded to that and I think some eight or nine hundred people if, if, if memory serves right were actually mobilized is that list still being worked upon and are there people there who can be brought in to support staff through not only the COVID crisis that we're dealing with but also the other the other uh, winter pressure factors that Ian has referred to there as well so clearly we have an urgent need for more staff are, are is that list still actively being worked through or is, are there other um, plans in place to 
see how many people out in our in our community we can mobilise into supportive roles in terms of healthcare and delivery. So the workforce appeal is still uh, there, and people are still uh, being called upon f- who have you know b- came forward um, to work in the health service. Um, last weekend, you'll be aware that all five trusts put out a, a, an appeal to a registered nurses in particular, and um, the Belfast Trust had some success with that. Um, other trusts didn't. So I think that's um, that's a, 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 that signifies where we are with this. The, num- the numbers are obviously uh, less fruitful now than they were at the start of the pandemic. Um, many of the people who did come forward are, are, are and were in posts, and there are still some people um, being employed. Many of them have gone to the the vaccination centres or others um, employed um, by the public health agency in the testing um, in the in the office there, the test and trace um, environment. And um, I think that we are at a point where um, our workforce, as I've said, is very tired. They are working most uh, are working additional hours um, as best they can. And we just have to recognise that um, there are no there are no magic solutions to increasing the workforce significantly to get us through either this period um, of surge or through the winter. Uh, we will have obviously our new graduates um, coming from uh, university this year um, from a range of different professions who will all be employed in the health service um, as they do every year. And for nursing, that's in the region of about 900 uh, this year. Obviously, that will be incrementally increasing over the next few years, given the increase in undergraduate places up to uh, 1,325. So the first group of the 1,325 will be out in 2023. Okay, and in terms of the workforce appeal then to date, how many people have applied for that? Um, I don't know if Jim has those figures with him, but I, I don't have the total figures um, here with me. Yeah, Colin, Jim, certainly... Jim, how, how many I applied and how many full-time equivalent have been mobilised via that appeal? Okay, I mean, as Charlotte said, the appeal is ongoing. It started in April 20. We also renewed it again in April 21. So since it started, uh, there was... 27,000 formal applications, and go, there's a lot of detail around that, about 4,000 pe- appointments from that. And since the appeal in April 21, just to give the details from this April to now, um, we've recruited approximately 850 from that appeal, 500 in the health and social care workers, and 380 in support arrangements. In terms of that, overall 4,000, over 2,500 are in health and social care appointments, and the remainder are in support roles. So it's still very active. I would I echo what Shard has said. There's no easy, quick fix, magic wand for capacity. If there was, we would be trying to utilise it. But what we are doing is all we can. So we've got the workforce appeal. We've also a range of other initiatives in place to, to, to try and support and incentivise um, workers do some additional hours to try and address what you've described as the pressures in terms of doing as much as we can to protect elective uh, and uh, improve elective surgery. Um, dealing with the critical care, but I would echo what Short had said and what Professor Young said. Part of the challenge we have is the increased pressures arising from, you know, COVID admissions to hospitals, COVID admissions to ICU, because all of those hospital beds and all of that capacity is also needed to address the significant backlogs we had in terms of complex surgery and elective surgery. So it is a difficult nut to crack. We remain. Um, focused on trying to do what we can. The workforce appeal is very active. We're looking at other initiatives in, ter- in terms of um, overtime rates and make it incentivizing some additional hours. Um, so we're trying to use that, utilize all the levers we have, but it is very challenging. Okay, and Charlotte, just uh, and and I, and I and I think we do understand that that there is no magic wand here. This is this is a, a massive a massive difficulty that's been ongoing for some time and uh, needs planning and, and a lot of work over a sustained period of time. Are, are there any plans to address the flexibility issue so that core health and social care staff can uh, get that flexibility? They may need it at a particular time rather than losing them to agency and then the costs and the disruption and the, the difficulties of that. So is there any look being taken at the contracts to see if we can um, match those and provide the flexibilities within the core staff. Uh, so, Chair, um, as you know, the department, our, our, our main aim is to stabilise the workforce. And a lot of what we've been doing is about recruitment, is about 
you know, getting getting the numbers um, in the undergraduate programs, the overseas program, 886 nurses um, so far with another 53 um, en route, the workforce appeal, as you've heard from from Jim, etc. I think um, we need a retention strategy, and that's where I'm putting my mind to at the moment to work with the directors of nursing to look to see what we can do to provide that flexibility, because I mean, it's not the, the health service and, and the professionals who go into the health service now are, are, is not like it was. I'm sure Ian would agree when whenever we started out in our careers where your aim was to get a permanent job, you know, secure a mortgage and, and uh, you had your pension. Young people and even more mature people now don't see themselves just being in one post and having one permanent post. They want that flexibility and the health service. We, we will have to find ways to respond. The difficulty is obviously keeping the service going. Um, you know, it has to be about the needs of patients and the needs of the service, while we also uh, find a way to be flexible with staff to allow them those opportunities in the hope that they will come back uh, when they can and, and, and bring with them the learning that they've had. Okay, thank you. And then a couple then, thank you, Charlotte, a couple then for Patricia. Patricia, there has been recent uh, evidence, I'm sure you're aware of it, a recent um, evidence being presented around the, uh, it, it, just a quote from the CDC, it's now very clear that immunity starts to fall after the initial two doses and with the dominance of the Delta variant, we're starting to see evidence of reduced protection against mild and moderate disease. So what are the plans for a booster campaign in the autumn and what are the plans for dealing with that given that we're also aware that GPs are under tremendous pressure and people are struggling at times to access GPs and GPs are working harder than they've ever been working. What plans are in place to provide the boosters? And uh, can you enlighten us on that, please? Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for the question. Um, we've not yet received the final advice from JCVI, but we've been advised that that will be with us by the middle of September. Uh, however, we've had some interim advice and we're planning on that basis. So um, on that basis, we're expecting that we will be vaccinating the over 50s and those who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, of all ages um, and uh, health and social care workers. So we will be starting with care homes, care home staff, uh, frontline staff and the older adults over the age of 70. Um, part of the advice, uh, again, has been that to co-administer with flu where possible. Now, some individuals may, may not wish this, but um, it may not be appropriate in some cases. But where possible, we are planning on that basis. So we're planning for a program that will be with in general practice. And um, as you know, I've, I've previously briefed committee about the recruitment of vaccinators. We've retained a central pool and indeed that central pool supported general practice in delivering uh, the program to date. We intend to continue that uh, through the booster uh, campaign. Um, part of what I was describing earlier with community pharmacy, we hope would be in place by the middle to late September that we will have that extensive network of community pharmacy with the Moderna vaccine been able to participate in the uh, booster program, as well as providing ongoing opportunities for first and second doses. And indeed, trusts will then uh, vaccinate staff, will be sending out uh, pretty uh, early on uh, mobile teams out to care homes. So we're at a, an advanced stage of planning. But again, until the final advice is received, indeed, about the type of vaccine, we're anticipating that it will be uh, Pfizer and Moderna. However, um, until that final advice is received, we'll not confirm any of our arrangements. But we're, we're trying to make as much of this as foolproof as possible and build up that kind of infrastructure uh, to protect. Um, of course, we're still... Uh, Chairman, we're still actively vaccinating. And I, I think some of the studies that were published today, for example, are saying that there is continued um, uh, uh, efficacy from the vaccine uh, after some months. So that is very reassuring. Um, however, um, care... Can I just check there uh, with the clerk? I think I have lost on my end, Patricia. Is that the same for yourselves? Yes, yes Chair, we lost Patricia as well. Okay. So I think we'll uh, we'll go on to other members then for questions to Charlotte while we're waiting to get to get uh, Patricia back on the line. We can we can pick up again on that. So I'll go then to Paula. Uh, so I have Paula, Pam, Alan, and Jerry at this stage. So Paula, go ahead, please. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, um, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I just wanted to raise the issue of nurses who are off with long COVID. I've been contacted by a couple who um, are now moving into six months plus and going down to half pay, and they're feeling very dispirited. And I'm just wondering what support is being given to, to nurses who are off with long COVID. Also, um, other nurses have come to say they've sort of seen an increase in abuse. You know, I think people are, are feeling frustrated because a lot of services are down. So it's just really, you know, how how nurses are being um, better supported, and if you could give us any indication of when the cancer strategy is going out to um, consultation, I know you've been working on that. Thank you. Um, thanks, uh, Paula. So, um, in relation to uh, long COVID, um, obviously, um, people who are off sick have uh, support of their employer and occupational health. Um, and in addition to that, as I think I heard Jim mentioned earlier, we have um, now in place um, a health and wellbeing. Um, for staff in the Belfast Trust, which we hope to roll out very quickly to the other trusts, um, and and staff um, on sick leave would also have access to to that route. Um, in addition to that, um, I've actually just commissioned a piece of work um, from uh, a lead researcher at the um, National Institute for Research, uh, and she will be coming over to. Um, to work with specialist nurses who can provide advice um, looking at the top symptoms of COVID, which um, are not necessarily those which we think would be uh, um, fatigue, brain fog, post-exercise um, fatigue and, and some respiratory symptoms uh, are, are the main areas we'd be looking at for those specialist nurses to provide an information leaflet and advice specifically for uh, professions um, to ensure they have the right information provide it with the best advice on how to re rehabilitate and take forward their recovery from long COVID. So I hope that that will be happening in September. So um, in relation to increased abuse, you're correct. There is a, a significant rise in the number of um, abusive behaviours towards all healthcare staff. Um, it's unacceptable. Uh, we have we have a zero tolerance uh, to that in the health service. Um, Staff are supported at the time of the incident, obviously, with uh, the team that are, are there with them. Um, I was in uh, Daisy Hill earlier this year after a very significant um, uh, incident where uh, two members of staff were seriously hurted with uh, a knife attack. And um, I spoke directly to the staff involved. And it's the emotional trauma that that causes for people, as well as the psychological scars that it, uh, um, it leaves, as well as the physical impact. and. Um, staff are very concerned about that uh, and it's one of the reasons why people uh, will choose to work in particular environments um, and again help is um, available for them through their employer and through occupational health and also through their professional organizations like the RCN and your third question was in relation to the cancer strategy so uh, it, uh, the cancer strategy is actually um, with the minister um, he has approved it and uh, we had hope to do a launch um, next week, uh, just confirming the details with the Minister, but it will be, it's very imminent. That's great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Paula, and I'll go to, to Pam. Um, Patricia, I'll come back to you at the end and pick up just where on you left. I've moved on to other members there while you were off, so thank you. And I'll go to Pam, go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Chair, and really, Chair, you had touched upon um, the questions I want to ask around that workforce appeal. Uh, in around the the red tape uh, in the system and flexibility. I mean, it, it just strikes me that it's uh, it's vital that we address this flexibility issue, uh, both in terms of ensuring that we get um, all the help we can from the workforce appeal and uh, to ensure that we actually retain the, the brilliant staff that we do have, because obviously those ICU nurses in particular are, are so highly um, skilled. You're not going to come across too many um, highly skilled workers like that that you can uh, that you can call upon when you need them in these very um, difficult times. And there's there's more than COVID going on, uh, and we need those highly skilled um, healthcare workers in order to to ensure that um, cancer operations and and the elective care that's so badly needed now is able to continue. So I really would appeal um, to, to you, Charlotte, and to uh, those who, who can make the changes necessary to ensure that that flexibility and that the, the red tape issue is looked at so that we can harness um, every um, good person that we, we have to, uh, to support them. Uh, but I suppose my, my question for you, Charlotte, would be 
in and around what supports are available uh, in terms of uh, both physical and mental health of those um, healthcare workers who have really uh, faced the brunt of COVID in particular and the horrors of COVID. Um, what supports are there for, for them? And uh, are you looking at how you can uh, bring them back even into other areas? Because I think it's actually quite unfair that there may be um, staff members who are so heavily relied upon that they're almost um, forced to keep dealing in, in these very traumatic circumstances. And it, it may not be realistic uh, that, that, that they can keep doing so uh, for uh, prolonged periods of, of time. So what supports are you putting in to ensure that, 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 that those members are um, fully supported in every way possible so that you can retain them as, as staff members within the trusts? Um, thanks, Pam. So, so as I said in my, my remarks, I, I do believe that nursing, in particular, and and, and middle free, um, middle free have have um, and more recent issues to deal with in terms of um, the availability of midwife versus the delivery of care and um, the, the 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 prevalence of um, the COVID virus uh, with pregnant ladies and uh, the severe illness that can be um, associated with that, and that they are dealing with that. Um, in relation to nursing, um, as I've said, um, nursing has in some ways held this together for the health service, um, particularly in environments like ICU, um, the COVID wards and, and, and further afield. And there is psychological support available in, in all ICUs. We have um, introduced um, reflective supervision across all the ICUs in, in a group uh, sense where people can um, reflect on what has happened because um, with the use of PPE and with social distancing, what normally happens in the health service if there's a traumatic event or, or staff have had a particularly difficult time, they will get together. Uh, they will talk about it. They'll probably have someone will bring in a cake. They'll have an extended coffee break. They'll hug. They'll support each other. And during COVID, all of the normal things that we would do to support staff actually couldn't happen. Um, because we dis disencourage people from being together in that way. We maintain social distancing, harder for people to have breaks together, et cetera, et cetera. So um, psychological support has been put in place across all organisations. The minister has uh, published his framework supporting the wellbeing needs of our health and social care staff during COVID. Um, we have underpinned that with the, the uh, Thrive project in Belfast. And um, I, I know that they are beginning to see trends in, in the in the the type of, of uh, worker that is most affected by that. Um, that does open up quite a few um, opportunities for staff because they can self-assess themselves against um, a number of symptoms. And then that will be uh, reviewed by a, an expert practitioner in mental health and they will be signposted to an appropriate um, source of help or information. So in a way, it's really helpful for staff to do that early, to allow them to stay and work, to feel better, uh, prepared to deal with the mental trauma of this by getting that support uh, much earlier in the process. And um, for those who, who are struggling, um, I, I think we have to support them in every way we can. Um, and their employer will be obviously responsible for that. There, I know that um, staff have said they welcome the support they're receiving at the moment from senior nurses right across uh, the health service and the visible presence of those out uh, uh, supporting staff. So I think there are a number of measures um, al already in place. I, I think there are other um, issues that are impacting on that uh, as well, and that's the ability to deliver care, to be able to work with your team uh, in your normal env environment and um, ensuring that uh, staff are available to do that has been very difficult because some very difficult decisions have had to be made about transferring staff from one environment to another in order to prioritise the care of the most vulnerable. And, and ICU is a perfect example of that, where staff have had to be redeployed from theatres um, and from other environments into an ICU environment. And that has been extremely stressful. And, and, and I wouldn't want anyone to take away from that. And I also think that um, as healthcare providers, uh, there's um, we do build a resilience uh, in, in how we work with uh, this kind this level of, of, of emotional trauma. However, this is this pandemic has gone on far longer than any of us would have thought. And and my message to staff is that it's OK to be not OK. It's perfectly OK to be not OK. And there should be no psychological, um, I suppose, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, um, stigma attached to that. Uh, and it isn't is in no way a sign of you being less resilient. I think it's it's a, a it's a sign of the times that uh, staff have had to work in. So um, if there if there are other things that uh, need to be done to support staff, the department's certainly working with the HR directors to look at that. Uh, and we are constantly reviewing that. And I'm in I'm, I'm in contact with with staff. There are practical things we are doing, as Jim has said, around enhanced rates and ensuring people feel valued for the extra work that they are doing. Um, Another issue uh, appears to be, um, particularly in nursing, um, taking breaks and um, hydrating um, uh, because of the donning and doffing process that has to be undertaken. Um, staff are not always uh, minded to take breaks as frequently as we would like them to. And again, I've been using social media to promote to, to promote the, necess the necessity of that because um, your own hydration obviously has an impact on how you function and how you provide care. And and it's 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 a, a human right and a, a basic need for people to have uh, food and fluids on a long shift. Okay, thank you. Okay, Pam. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Moving on to Alan. Go ahead, Alan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, Charlotte. Charlotte, I, I recently had a meeting with the Royal College of uh, Nursing Representatives and the. Uh, they were uh, telling me about the sort of the, the increase of assaults uh, on nursing staff and, and uh, disturbingly, uh, some of this has now even shifted into the, the ward setting uh, as opposed to where we would have expected it in the past on a, a Friday night and a Saturday night, maybe an exit and emergency with uh, alcohol and drug fueled um, assaults. Um, but there seems to be now Another issue has, has entered into the equation in, in the hard-pressed accident emergency departments with so many people bypassing the normal uh, filters and going straight to hospital uh, that we're now getting a, a frustration factor um, which is leading to uh, a lot of maybe verbal, uh, very unacceptable verbal abuse uh, on nurses around about people maybe having to wait much longer than what they they normally would. Is there is there really is there more that we could be doing uh, to protect our, our nursing staffs uh, uh, in these sort of frontline situations? Uh, could we make a case for more visible uh, and increased um, security presence uh, in the uh, accident emergency departments? And uh, could there be maybe a case made for? Um, an advertising campaign to uh, just to create uh, a public awareness of this and that it is uh, a totally unacceptable uh, situation to be placing our, our frontline medical staff uh, in. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you. And um, I, mean, I think we partly had this discussion a little earlier, but I think it is important that, that staff feel physically safe and psychologically safe in their place of work. Uh, and that goes without saying. And of course, many of them will have, um, or they'll all have had training on how to protect themselves in, in, in difficult and, and threatening situations. Um, our security staff um, are there to support them uh, and are there quickly when needed. Um, I think there's, I think there's, there's always a fine line to be walked between um, de-escalating a situation and, and, and bringing in uh, more security. And I understand that initially staff might feel more secure with that in place but i think it will be it would need to be risk assessed and um organizations would need to think very carefully about that because actually sometimes it can have the opposite um effect we also know that um some people because of their condition um their behavior is altered and and every healthcare and social care uh, practitioner understands that and, and this is not the group of people i think that either you or the rcn or myself would be referring to. Um, we, we understand that um, altered behaviour can be part of a, of a condition, um, but there are there are people who who are just not accepting of the very uh, difficult challenges that our health service staff are facing at the moment. Um, and there is in society, I think, um, a requirement to respond urgently to everything. And I think some of that's driven by um, access to internet, uh, immediate access to information, immediate access to, um, you know, social media, etc. 
and but that is not how the health service works um and and i think um, a dialogue with with communities around how we are currently treating our health service staff uh, in that regard would be very useful it has been said to me time and time again nobody wants people out clapping for them uh, but they do want to be treated with respect thanks charlotte thank you alan um i'm going to jerry carol jerry go ahead please Thanks, Chair. Thanks, um, Charlotte. I mean, you kind of alluded to it uh, already in terms of the, the importance of, of our workforce. And uh, during the pandemic, you know, they were the greatest asset in terms of keeping people uh, alive in ICU, um, consoling people who lost loved ones um, because of COVID and other issues. Um, and I, what, what I'm detecting um, is a lot of uh, Healthcare workers feeling insulted, angry, uh, and let down by uh, the pay offer of three percent, um, which the health minister has obviously followed uh, the line of the Tories, um, and people are feeling real, really uh, angry uh, about this. Um, the last time, as, as you obviously well know, that healthcare workers <laughs> felt angry about pay, they, they took strike action, and obviously, eventually, the money uh, that we were told was not there was found. Um, and given you know the scale of, of what healthcare workers and everybody, but in particular healthcare workers have been through uh, in the last year, um, uh, I think it is frankly insulting that they're only offered three percent, uh, which you know barely in many cases keeps in line uh, with uh, inflation. Um, and I you know want to put on record just uh, my opposition to that offer. But Charlotte, uh, I wanted to ask. What is your assessment uh, of the impact uh, on this offer on staff? Uh, you talked already about staff morale. The chair referenced people, uh, you know, leaving the health service. Uh, we already have an issue with that. Um, and you said the staff are tired. They absolutely are tired. Uh, but what I'm picking up in a strong uh, sense is they're absolutely tired of uh, insulting uh, pay offers. So regardless of whether you think the pay offer is good, bad, or different, uh, I wanted to ask your opinion on how that offer uh, will affect staff um, in the health service. Thank you. Um, Jerry, um, I think that obviously the award that's been offered is to be formalised um, still with uh, professional bodies and trade unions, but it's the recommendation of the independent review body was 3%. And I think it's in line with uh, what has happened in other jurisdictions. I understand that staff, you know, as I said all along, have really gone over and above um, the call of duty for quite a significant time and I can understand why people would feel that a higher pay award would be appropriate. Um, I think there are other issues at play here as I've mentioned earlier um, around the availability of staff, safe staffing, uh, new uh, people coming into the health service and our ability to retain our staff by offering them more flexible working and more access to you know, one thing thing that I hear constantly from my colleagues in practice is the need for a clinical career pathway um, and um, to be able to advance in, in, a, in, a, in a clinical environment without having to leave to go to management or, or research or, or, or other areas of practice. And, you know, we have started to do that work through the stabilisation of the nurse and midwifery task group report and the money that's been made available for safe staffing from New Decade, New Approach, 25 million this year, I have already uh, with the public health agency and with the trust plans are in place for uh, nearly 300 additional posts that will help to develop those career pathways, particularly in areas like cancer, where we've committed to an additional 30 posts at educator level so that we can support staff working in those very difficult um, environments um, and where we can begin to look at extending the scope and skills that, that um, I, I know nurses can, can provide and, and midwives. Um, given the opportunities to have those advanced clinical career pathways through advanced practice, specialist practice, etc. So, so I think um, in the round, I hope that the other things that we are doing along with the pay award will be sufficient to uh, sustain and, and stabilise our workforce. And that's our major aim at the moment. Thanks. Uh, just a quick follow up, Chair. Um, I mean, the healthcare workers stood by us all during the pandemic and, and many of them feel that uh, they're not being stood by with a, with a pay offer. And, I think, frankly, um, and with the greatest respect, Charlotte, I think people would uh, expect the, the chief nurse officer with a stronger uh, rebuttal uh, of uh, you know a pay offer that falls way, way, way short 
of what uh, health workers unions and their representatives um, are, are demanding. And if we have a problem with people uh, leaving the health service, obviously one of those reasons is lack of um, lack of them feeling uh, respected, uh, lack of uh, movement on and progression on pay. So I, I think that this uh, is going to be very um, damaging for our health service and, and catastrophic as well. So I think it needs to be a stronger line uh, taken uh, against it. Thanks. Jerry, um, you will appreciate my role is to pr provide advice to the minister and to the department and other departments on that. I, I don't provide advice on, on workforce policy issues such as this. Um, and um, my advice will continue to be to provide the minister uh, um, at his request uh, on retention and recruitment issues and professional practice of, of nurses and midwives and um, allied health professions. Sorry, Jerry, you're on mute. Deborah on arm. So if I could then go back then to Patricia. Patricia, could you you pick up your your you were outlining how the pressure of an additional vaccine program in the autumn is going to be uh, managed, uh, forecasting that that's likely to be likely to be uh, undertaken, and how that's going to be managed in a way that that helps to protect the GP services, protect GPs and other healthcare staff, and and that. So if you could pick up on that again, please. We just lost you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not quite sure at what point um, my signal cut out, but if I just say again that um, we expect this interim advice to be consolidated sometime in the middle of September. We're planning for a programme that will begin at the end of September, beginning of October, no later than, and that we would be commencing with the most vulnerable group that were vaccinated first, um, and uh, that it would be three-pronged as before. Uh, with a greater role for community pharmacy on this occasion, because we now have that capacity and we're building that up through uh, September to hopefully those over 300 uh, and potentially more uh, community pharmacies right throughout Northern Ireland who would be involved in the booster programme. Uh, we work closely indeed, I met last evening with uh, the GP representatives, um, both from the board and the different uh, representative bodies. And we've been talking through the practicalities of that delivery. We will support them with that um, band of centrally recruited vaccinators, which was very welcome on the last occasion. And indeed, we're trying to make this as easy as possible. Um, but it it is inevitably an additional burden for all of those concerned who, by the time we complete this, will have been vaccinating for well over a year. Uh, you know, we started planning last uh, November, we commenced at the beginning of December. And this programme, because of the, the slightly delayed advice, I think is likely to run into the early new year. Um, so we'll do absolutely everything that we can. Uh, trusts are gearing up, um, as is always the case with those who are very operationally expert. They're keen to get going now. Um, but of course, we can't uh, do that in advance of the final advice being received. But they're already thinking through their outreach into care homes and uh, their organisation of the staff vaccination programme, which indeed was the earliest part of the programme last year. OK, thank you. And then taking a different tack on that same question, is there is there a possibility or in your view in terms of the vaccination could there be a more effective use of, of that additional vaccination capacity in terms of, as I already mentioned, the 12 to 15 year olds? And I'm also conscious that we are uh, living on a small island and the other part of this island, the 26 counties, are rolling out um, their vaccine. And, and they have now significantly, uh, I think, caught up, if not overtaken in terms of rates. But they're doing 12 to 15 year olds. Now, just just taking my own example, um, in our football club, where, where my children go to training, there are children from the other side of the border. They travel back and forth for school, for youth clubs, for lots of other things that are that are ongoing and may be ongoing. So what's your own view? And, and I, I am aware that the JCVA guidance um, has been utilised. It is, it is not, a, I suppose, a requirement. It is, it is guidance from JCVA. We don't necessarily have to follow that, although I accept that we have done to date. But is there is there better uses of the vaccine program with those twelve to fifteens and even younger? And we have I have been approached by a significant number of people with vulnerable younger children than twelve. What's your view on those on those issues, please? Uh, well, uh, uh, Chair, I mean I think I've stated before. Um, uh, 
uh, in Northern Ireland, we are committed to following the JCVI advice. And as I said, they're, they're by no means uh, finished their deliberations on this issue. They are looking at the scientific evidence for the risk uh, benefit. Um, as I said, we have about 2,000 of the 12 to 15 year olds that were vaccinating either because of individual vulnerability or because of the vulnerability of the household members. Um, we, I think the, the, the difference between dealing with the 12 to 15 year old population is that they are within the school system. We have a very expert school vaccination program and indeed um, those nurses have been supporting us um, extensively during the uh, recent program. Uh, so if, if revised advice does um, include the vaccination of 12 to 15 year olds, we will work within that school system because that would be a more efficient way to do it. Uh, they, they're um, very experienced at doing this over a wide range of uh, vaccinations. Um, but I think we will not be moving ahead of JCVI advice, I think, uh, Chair. And in terms of, uh, in terms of North-South cooperation, are you actively engaged with uh, those responsible for rolling out the vaccine in the South? And um, do you recognise the importance of that uh, single epidemiological element to the, to the, uh, the, uh, our situation here? Uh, indeed, I think you already heard from the Chief Scientific Advisor that there are uh, regular connections between our, ourselves and our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, um, both in terms of the planning of the vaccination programme at different touch points during it, um, and uh, 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 and I think in terms of the the assessment of risk and indeed I think there are ongoing meetings that, that I'm not personally involved in but uh, the others would be um, and and I have been in contact with those who are delivering the vaccination program at different points where we share experience take advice um, etc um, throughout this last year. Okay, thank you, Patricia, and. Um, just a final one then, Charlotte, in terms of the the, uh, the the plans for future training. Have you a detailed um have you a detailed plan at this point in time over the next number of years of how many of different uh, disciplines are needed and how many are being planned for in terms of training, given the long term nature of, of the difficulty that, that you have outlined there? So in terms of nursing staff and, and allied health professionals and um do you have a detailed breakdown at this point in time? Is that a work in progress? And are you confident that you will have the capacity within the education system and also the, the resources to uh, deliver on those staff that are needed in the time ahead? So um, I I'll partly answer the question, Chair, if, you, if, if I may, and then ask uh, Jim to, fo to follow up because this is in his, um, his portfolio uh, in relation to... Um, Nursing and Middlefree, uh, firstly, uh, it's a work in progress. I have commissioned some um, dynamic systems modeling now that we have access to that in terms of looking at uh, at a very basic level, nurses and midwives in, nurses and midwives out. But actually, when you overlay that then with um, the age of the workforce, uh, the various pension arrangements, uh, one of the things that it has thrown up already is that uh, when nurses um, go part time, say to have a family, they never actually come back full time. And um, we need to factor that into our to our, our planning or you know, our workforce planning. So it's very much work in progress. Um, we have a, a commitment um, this year, the second the second year of the uh, 1325. Um, hopefully that will continue next year. But obviously with an annual budget, um, it's very hard for us to predict um, what will be available next year. Uh, on the AHP side, uh, we have just completed a workforce plan that's currently going through departmental approvals, uh, but we do know what the numbers would look like um, in the next few years um, for that. Uh, uh, things change so quickly that even predicting five years ahead is, is a little bit tricky. Um, the, the issue um, in terms of availability um, for education providers, I think that that is there and we've worked in partnership with all three uh, universities to uh, make sure that they have the appropriate skills and resources to deliver. The problem in uh, nursing uh, in particular at the moment is the increased number of 1325. So, you know, that doubles each year. You put another cohort in for three years. Um, 
there are thousands of undergraduate nurses um, in our system at the moment and they all need practice placements. 50% uh, of their undergraduate degree is in, is in practice. And there are some um, issues with practice placements, both because obviously services have changed um, as a result of the pandemic, but also um, because of the availability of, of mentors and places to support those. So um, I'm not suggesting that we wouldn't need to increase those numbers anymore. I, I, I think the system dynamic modeling will help us understand that, but there really wouldn't be much more capacity in our system to train uh, many more nurses and midwives and you know, we we also have many other healthcare professions in, in training, allied health professions, paramedics as part of that, just on stream, our medical colleagues, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we have to look at that in, in the round. Um, but obviously, Jim is leading on the workforce strategy. Uh, so I, I'll pass over to him for his comments. And Jim, if you if you could also, Jim, just address uh, and Charlotte has said kind of nurses in, nurses out and that. But does it also take into account the demographics that we're facing here in terms of an aging population, more people needing care, more comorbidities? An example just from my own practice here in, in this area was that the team I was working with, the older persons team, the intake or the, the caseload in that team was increasing when I was there a number of years ago, five and six percent per year. But there was no additional resource. That was just that pressure was going on staff. So is that is the demographics being factored in to this longer term planning as well? Thank you, Chair. I'll take I'll take that on, on sort of I'll maybe come to that three three points. First of all, yes, we have a health and social care workforce strategy for the whole health and social care workforce, and that was um, 2026, published in 2018. And we're working through that. And how we're working through it, and and um, Charlotte's indicated, we work through it both on the professional side, but also on a wraparound um, sort of, if you like, care pathway. Uh, most recently, we've done that on the cancer strategy. And that workforce plan is, those workforce plans very much are co-designed and informed by demographics and, and demands, but also clinicians. Uh, and they, they cover right the way through from pre-registration, workforce supply, workforce demand, um, post-registration, training and learning and education. So it, it tries to encompass all of that. The, 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 key, the key factors that... Um, or the challenges we face uh, are a doing the plans they take time and as charlotte's indicated it's a dynamic situation it's hard to predict two three four five years but that's what we're trying to do because that's what we need for a long-term workforce plan um, the second is making sure we have whatever infrastructure is needed to deliver those plans and, and charlotte's referred to for example on the medical side they need to make sure that you have sufficient um spaces to to learn and uh, both in terms of for example the general medical school um, expansion that we have uh, in the northwest and the third bit and this is a critical bit and i know the minister's mentioned it numbers of times increasing workforce requires multi-year budgets um you know as we go to expand and increase our workforces um trying and a, a commitment to implement these plans we need to make sure we have the funding in place and that always remains a challenge i mean uh, shards made clear reference to the fact that you know the, the significant impact from the additional funding that was secured through the new decade new approach agreement and how that's enabled and almost you know opened up um significant expansion in terms of nursing uh, we will be needing and and calculating whatever additional investment we need to deliver on those workforce plans so the strategies in place the plans are co-designed they take account of all the demographics uh, and they look right the way through to training uh, workforce supply, retention, recruitment, all of those things have to be considered as well as then um, de delivery. But we do have to understand there, there are some limiting factors around those. But but it is a strategic approach. And, we're, and I think to um, capture your question, uh, Chair, it's a, it's a sort of movable phase. Some are a work in progress. Some have been more or less completed or in the implementation phase. Um, hopefully the allied health professional will soon be landing and it'll be into the implementation phase and we're moving on to other areas. As I said, a lot of it around now the programs of care as much as professions. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to check, Jerry, is, is your hand up again there, Jerry? Have you something else briefly, Jerry? You were looking to come in? Yeah, sure, thanks briefly. Your, your guidance on it. Um, I have a number of uh, consistency uh, complaints and inquiries about the special recognition payment, people who have had their 
universal credit uh, reduced or completely stopped uh, because of the payment. So um, I'm looking a bit of guidance if, if anybody on this call is uh, taking any lead on that or any work on that issue, but it's a, it's a major issue for myself and I'm sure other members. So um, just a bit of guidance, chair on where's best sure. to direct that issue. Sure, I'm yeah. happy to take um, separately from Jerry, I'm happy to if you if you send those queries to me, I'm happy to to look at them. And I had I had asked at the last meeting that the, the department would put in place some resource to deal with that. I'm also here in Charlotte recent days where staff have been asked to return payments. Are you aware of that? And are you aware of the causes for it? And how's that being addressed? Uh, I can't say I am aware, Chair. I, again, Chair, that probably falls on 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 my side of things. Um, well, I'll, I'll forward I'll forward the specifics, but I have heard from a number of angles yeah. that. Yeah, so yeah, I think I, I think I think what I was aware, and I certainly we can provide maybe, uh, depending on the nature of the queries, it might be easy to give a written, uh, a sort of a written update on special recognition and issues um, to to the committee. But equally, I'm happy to take the queries. I was aware that there were a few minor, uh, not not a huge number of incidents of some overpayments that might have been made, and uh, surely due to primarily a computer uh, error, um, but. I'm happy to take any queries uh, and look into those specifically and also maybe provide a more general uh, written yeah. response on the progress on the special recognition and some any issues that have that have arisen. Well, listen, that would be useful and I appreciate that, Jim, and the committee would appreciate that being forwarded on. And, and if there is any more detail in terms of the workforce planning that can be sent on, including work in progress, if we can get a, an understanding of where that's at and where the challenges are likely to be, I think that would be useful for the committee as well. So I want to thank each and every one of you. I'm conscious we have lost Ian at this stage. I want to thank each and every one of you um, to wish you all the very best in the, what is continues and is likely to be an even more challenging, difficult time ahead as we move forward. Um, and, and just to recognise all of yourselves and all of your staff who are delivering in such difficult circumstances. Um, it's totally unprecedented and it continues, uh, as you said earlier, Charlotte, long beyond many of us would have hoped or guessed that it could have done. And, and that is providing additional pressures into the system as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I can let you go and then I'll just close our meeting down, but uh, thank you to all the officials for this morning. Gordon Adolf. Okay, members, so I'd just like to close with just a, a, a reflection and a reference to that big jab weekend that's taken place. And just to put a message out there and, a, and an appeal to people in general, but the young people in particular, please take advantage of the vaccine and the protections that it offers you and indeed the, the flexibilities and freedoms that, that that vaccine offers you, your family, your community, and our entire society here, and the health service in, in terms of protecting that. So I would just ask people to take a look at that. It is a very convenient system um, in terms of being available on a walk-in basis. And I would urge all young people to make that their main, their main job and their main focus this weekend. Please go out and get yourself vaccinated. Okay, members, I want to thank you all for attending today, the second of our meeting over the summer. And um, I, I also want to very specifically thank the entire um, committee staff who, regardless of this being a one-off meeting, have a certain amount of work to do to put everything together for the meeting and the broadcasting uh, element of it. So I want to thank you all for, for your attendance and to thank all of the, uh, the committee team and all of your team, Keith, for your, for your efforts. So that's our meeting at an end this morning. It's just time and place, date, time and place of next meeting. The next meeting will be an informal planning session on Thursday, the 2nd of September. And that is going to be two weeks earlier than the restart of the plenary sessions. And the clerk will provide further information to you all in relation to that next week. So thank you, members. Please take care for now. And uh, I wish you all the very best for the rest of the summer period. And hope everyone gets a bit of rest because we're clearly going to be hitting the ground running very, very fast again in, in the autumn. Gourmet, I'll give members. Thank you. Good time. Thank you. Uh -huh.